we talk about, uh, you know, which if you look into for everybody who's listening, um, Senator Murphy from uh, Connecticut has has introduced a bill and is pushing that and should be voting on that this week. And everybody out there, call your senator and call your congressman and tell them to vote on it. I live in D.C., so I don't have a senator, but you know, <laughs> that's a whole different story. Yeah, yeah. yeah different podcast. But we'll, I we'll get there. <laughs> the uh, the thing is, is bogging down in a policy ends up being being a distraction. If we talk different points on it, the bottom line is that no matter what happens, it's policy is not written in public opinion. Public opinion drives what policy is going to be. When it comes down to the nitty gritty on you know this provision and who's going to administrate it and all the small things bog down debate on gun reform. We can have those arguments in public, but it really doesn't matter because those are going to get debated and argued and narrowed down in committees, you know, with congressional staffers and congressmen in state house, as well as state houses um, around the country. I think the bigger push needs to be is that, you know, it's a longstanding statement that culture drives politics. And we as a country need to say enough is enough and drive the culture to say, if the culture around the country, whether it's the Midwest or it's Parkland, Florida, or Littleton, Colorado, if the culture drives enough momentum to say, look, we're done with this, we won't, t- we've had enough, and we're going to say never again, this, the policy wonks in DC will figure out the policy, figure out the legislative language, and figure right. out what it each, you know, everything means. But we have to drive the culture to push and say that we need reform and we don't need to be bogged down into legislative language, which that's that's what that's what the the far right, the NRA, they want to get bogged down in minute policy debates because then they can use the, the you know mass amount of expertise and lobbying and money they put into it to find because the layman is, you know, myself or Warx or you guys, we don't have. We haven't spent our entire lives focusing on one issue. So it's easy to get distracted by that. Mm -hmm. The biggest point I can say, and I think Warax is on to it, is say we need to drive that culture. Drive the culture in this country to say enough is enough. It's what happened. You know, it's what changed gay rights in this country. It's what changed, you know, civil rights in this country. It's the legislation will follow if what the country is feeling and powerfully, you know, animated about. So, I agree. Yeah, I think it's going to be hard uh, is what wins the fight. Uh, just like you were saying, you know, with the civil rights movement, with uh, the victories that we had recently with uh, marriage equality. Uh, but I, I, for me, I think that what stands out to me as something that is you know, relatable is the Vietnam War, where we uh, as, a, as a culture just said no. You know, once uh, it was clear that how wrong that war was once you start seeing the pictures the napalm girl you know the little girl running naked towards the journalists uh with you know horrible burns across of her uh her body uh, i i would like to not have that be what we need you know uh what, what i want to avoid is a, a future where we see a, a school shooting broadcast live on periscope uh, and, you know, with this last one, we almost had it. Uh, I don't know if you all saw it, but there were people uh, conducting, you know, basically interviews while that shooting was going on, uh, talking to students in the school. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not fearful that that will happen. I, I know uh, that if this continues down the road, that we will get a, a live broadcast school shooting and we'll actually see in real time uh, children being murdered, children lying on the ground dying. And, and there's just... There's no reason for it to get to that point because I don't believe that there's anyone who has a human heart in their chest who can sit down and honestly say to me, we should allow children to be murdered uh, because it's inconvenient for us to stop them from being murdered. Now, that's, that's not an argument that anyone can make. It, it's not an argument that anyone can win. So what should we do? You know, if the if heart is what's going to win this, and I, I think you're making a good point with that. If we're calling our senators and representatives, 
what should we be asking for? Should we focus on that? Should we be marching? Should we be focusing on voting? I think we absolutely like, should be marching. I think that it needs to be uh, public. I think that it needs to be uh, more than tweets. You know, this can't just be an online movement. There are marches coming up across the country. Mm -hmm. There are school walkouts. Uh, I'll be at the march in D.C. on March 24th. This has to be public and visible so that the lawmakers know that they will not be let off the hook for this. And that if they choose to continue to do nothing, that they're going to be voted out. Uh, because that, that honestly is, is what will change this. Once politicians realize that no matter how much money the NRA shoves at them, they're still going to get voted out of office, that's when the policy change that needs to happen will come. You know, I agree. Just the more public you can be, whether it's marching, uh, you know, marching on the 24th of March, being out there, whether it's calling your congressmen, calling your senators. And I, I would add to that, call your state representatives. Absolutely. As somebody who works on Capitol Hill, a congressional office, they while they do listen to calls, they get a lot of them. Now, I'm going to go on a limb here and say average state representative from Indiana, his office doesn't get a lot of calls. But if that office gets a lot, of, suddenly gets a lot of calls about gun reform, they're going to pay attention. And you start to change the laws in the state at the state level, and that and that it helps. And the more you know, you just build momentum. You know, as we talked, you know, we talked about earlier, civil rights, whether it's for racial equality or for gay rights, whatever, they happened at a smaller, at a local level and a state level before they happened at a national level. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna say don't call your congressmen or senators. I'm all about that. But be involved at the local level and pressure your state representatives. And if your state representatives aren't listening, run for office. <laughs> I mean, it, it's that was their attention. go run for office. I mean, I looked at my hometown and, and I live in D.C. now, but we're in my hometown where my parents live. The amount of votes that it takes to get to become a state representative in Colorado. Put it this way. I've got more retweets in the last week than, I've, <laughs> than it would take votes to get <laughs> And we can win at the small, if we win at the lower levels, we will win at the, at the national level. You know, it's got to be, it's got to be both sides, but take the fight to the local steakhouse, you know, take it to the local level because they, they don't know what's coming. And, you know, we've seen it, whether it's with veterans or with these kids or, you know, average man or woman on the street, whether it's, you know, mom's you know, mom and dad's looking and saying, like, I want my kids to be safe when they go to school. The population, in my opinion, and I feel it, is the entire across the entire country is on our side. And if we say, if we all stand up and say enough's enough, and we pressure local state representative Joe Smith, he's not he, he will cave because he wants to keep his job. And if he doesn't and if he doesn't want to keep his job that much, yeah. don't let him. <laughs> and, and I think that's what it's got to happen. The thing I, 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 I need it, you know, I can't to put a little real, realism into it is it's not going to happen overnight. We have to know that just like with every other major issue in this country's history it doesn't happen overnight. But uh, as long as we keep that sustained pressure, you know, we just don't let up. We'll change this country and we'll make it better. And, and, and by make it better, we're going to save lives. And, and I mean, what more what more what more purpose is there as a human being to do? I agree. I would especially like to encourage everyone in Indiana to call their state reps because <laughs> I live in Chicago and all of our guns come from Indiana. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Illinois actually is in the process of passing better laws, more you know stricter gun laws. And that's fantastic. And I'm very grateful for that. But it only does so much good because there is no wall between me and Indiana. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming on. This has been really good and really helpful. And I hope that uh, especially everyone who is a veteran who's listening will go on and join the Vets for Gun Reform, but also everyone else, you know, please, uh, please help amplify that message. I think yeah, please. You know, really and uh, yes, it is, you know, Vets for Gun Reform. But, you know, a conversation that we we're having I probably last night was that, you know, who, who is this movement for? You know, can people who weren't veterans support us? The answer is absolutely. I think that one of the things that I really enjoy about this movement is that it gives us the opportunity to bridge the gulf that exists between uh, the military population and the civilian population because veterans are civilians, you know, and I think that's something that we forget. 
uh, with the amount of energy and time we put into thanking veterans for their service, is, is we forget that all of us are American citizens first. Uh, so yes, absolutely. You know, this movement is has been started by veterans, but it is for this country. Uh, so please, you know, come march with us. Come, uh, come help us. Come amplify this message, because. We're not doing it for ourselves. We're here to help this country be better, be safer, uh, by lending the experiences that we have to this fight. You know, uh, I think, in particular, one of the most disingenuous things that the NRA does uh, is try to make this an issue over the details uh, and specifics of how guns work, and they can't do that to us. You know, you can't discredit us by saying. Daniel, you don't know what you're talking about when it comes to uh, an M4. Uh, he, yes, he absolutely does. Okay, it was his entire job. His life depended on knowing that weapon. So they can't discredit us in the same way that they can discredit other people. And I think that that makes us more powerful together to affect this change. Well, and so I'm very grateful that you guys are doing this because I I was saying in our last segment, I've never even touched a gun, so I do feel sure. sometimes like I, I lack authority when I talk about this. So I'm glad that the people who who don't have that same fear of lacking authority <laughs> are, are willing to, to stand up and uh, they're, talk about this. They're dangerous, you know, uh, that, that's the bottom line, uh, is that it's a tool like a hammer or a knife. But the difference, you know, uh, is that unlike a hammer, uh, guns exist to kill things. That's it. That's the only reason that they were invented. They weren't, uh, you know, they weren't invented for target practice. They weren't invented for anything except to kill. We have to recognize that and treat them as though, as as the thing they are, not as though. You know, we have to recognize that this is a tool for killing things, uh, and that means that we have to treat them with respect, and we have to make sure that people who should not have them uh, can't get to them. And I think. Uh, you know, not even talking about you know criminals uh, or terrorists or you know all these other scary bogeymen that the NRA throw at us. First and foremost, I'm talking about keeping guns out of the hands of children. You know, requiring them to be stored safely, requiring them to be locked up. Uh, and talking about liability uh, for parents who allow their children to use uh, weapons to go out and hurt other people. this segment, we have with us someone who's going to go by his Twitter handle, which is Red T Raccoon. Hello, Red. How are you? Great. Thanks so much for coming on. So longtime listeners may remember that Red was on an episode, when was that, December? Yeah, with Peter Morley. And so we've had Peter back on and now we're having Red back on as well. So I'm so thrilled you could join us uh, to talk about this subject. Maybe just to start, you could give us a, a sense of your experiences, what branch of the service you were in, and, and what kind of uh, work you did. I originally was in the Army Reserves. I was trained as a medic. This was back in 2001. I eventually became an EMT in the state of Connecticut. Um, I did that for a few years. And then towards the end of my term, uh, my contract, as far as the Army was concerned, I went and uh, was deployed to Iraq for 18 months as a medic. So between EMT work and work as far as the medic is concerned, I've firsthand seen the devastation in regards to guns and gun violence itself. And so it's something that hits home, especially with some other ties. I'm, I'm originally from Connecticut, and I lived in uh, Danbury, Connecticut, which is very far from ha Sandy Hook. Anyone from Connecticut, it's just such a tight-knit state. Any of those incidents or um, tragedies just kind of hit home to anybody who's connected to the state. And to be honest, too, I'm a father. I have a seven-year-old that goes to public school. And so I think that's another issue that I think everyone can relate to as far as being a parent is, you know, your concern as far as your, your kid's safety when it comes to just going to, going to school every single day. So... In the Army Reserves, were you trained in handling guns and shooting? 
Yeah, so by no means I wasn't a uh, web expert, but anybody